So I'm from Cairo, Egypt, and this is actually where I live. I live in that building over there. And uh, the reason I put this up is because I was talking in California earlier this year, and no, I do not live in a pyramid. And uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't go to work in a camel. So yeah, I, just, I, I have a car like everyone else, and I drive to work. I actually cycle to work because I live, I, I work just down the street. So yeah, this is where I'm from. I'm from the other end of the continent. And today I'm going to go through um, 10 stupid things I learned uh, in 10 years of advertising. Um, I spent 10 long, um, excruciating years in advertising before I quit and uh, moved on to become a good director. And I learned uh, uh, 10 things that I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to impart my knowledge. <laughs> Most of you are going to find it uh, stupid. Uh, I think the other half of you are going to find it um, very stupid. Uh, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping some of you, and um, a very little number of you, will find it not so stupid. Uh, yeah, these are my 10 years in advertising. I started in 2002 um, at the Miami Ad School. And then I went to Darcy. Darcy is... Uh, <laughs> anyone remember Darcy? Darcy is an agency that was very dodgy and then sort of shut down. Think it, and I went to Darcy Bucharest. It was owned by like, uh, an American Cuban mafia guy who ran it for a year, and then suddenly they just shut down. So I had to move to Germany, to Lagos Delaney. And uh, I spent two years as an art director at Lagos Delaney in Germany. And then I moved to Leo Burnett in Cairo. And then I was a creative director of JWT in Cairo. So it only took me five years to be a creative director, which is not such a good thing. And... Uh, <laughs> Then I moved to Dubai, where I was a uh, uh, regional creative director of JW, of, sorry, of Fortune Promo 7. And then I went back to Cairo and started my own agency, and these were two very good years at Elephant. And then uh, DDB asked me to shut it down and move to Germany, where I was ECD of DDB Berlin. So that's where I ended my 10 years. And like I said, they were very excruciating and painful. And what you realize is, the more you spend time in advertising, the more of a liar and a bullshitter you become. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> 10 years down the line, I thought uh, the bullshit was getting a bit too much, and that's when I decided to quit. And this is, this is me uh, at the beginning of my journey. I actually joined the Miami Ad School because I thought that's where you go to learn how to draw. I wanted to learn how to draw. I didn't want to be in advertising. I wanted to learn how to draw, and then somebody told me, you need to be an art director to learn how to draw. I didn't go to art school, I went to an ad school to learn how to draw, which is very strange. I mean, this is, this is what my drawing, but I mean my drawing improved, improved. This, is, this is what my drawing looked like when I first joined school. I had a little problem with perspective, that's a Mini Cooper in the back. <laughs> and, yeah, so I spent two years learning how to draw, and, and this, is, this is what my drawing looked like when I graduated. <laughs> so there's, there's perspective now, there's profile, dog with four legs. So yeah, I, 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 no, I mean really, there's no, there's no, I can't really find a reason why I went into advertising. I can't really find a reason why anyone would go into advertising. So I mean, I think we need to dig deep in our pasts and, and find something that happened in childhood that caused us to, to choose this as a career. And I, I dig deep and I asked my mom, I had, I had talks with my dad, I talked to my sisters, and I found it finally. It was in March 1976. I think my mother was, was, was bathing me. And something about the way, I think she touched me in a certain way that, bang, <laughs> advertising. That's, that's the look you have. <laughs> that's the look you have when you decide to be an art director or a copywriter. How, how many in here are in the creative? Uh, I like to size up my audience. How many in here are in the creative? Can, can we raise your hands? Okay, that's a lot. How many are uh, account people, account handlers, client servicing? Okay, not a lot. That's a good thing. And how many... <laughs> How many are planners? No plan, okay, a few planners. Marketing? Okay. How many have no idea why they're here? <laughs> okay. Okay, that's good. So the, the first thing I learned, and luckily I learned it very early on, I was at Lagos Delaney at the time, uh, is that advertising is not rocket science. I mean, many of us here would like to believe otherwise, and we are such a self-involved industry and we give ourselves a lot of importance when, in fact, we're not astrophysicists. We're not cloning the next sheep. I mean, advertising is <laughs> really not that important. So, uh, and I mean, there's something to learn from that. We should be, we should be having fun. 
And the people that are having fun are the people who are doing the great ads. And the people who are doing great ads are the people having fun. So it's almost like a vicious cycle of good ads and good fun. But unfortunately, you meet a lot of people who take this, this job uh, too seriously. And they make you feel like the deadline is the end of the world. Or you know that PPM document is the most important thing ever. You know? But no one, no one dies when you don't air on Tuesday. You know? So. <laughs> But this, this is very interesting. This, this, is how, this is how I learned that advertising is not that important. I was actually in Lagos Delaney. Um, I, I was watching pornography like a typical day of an art director, <laughs> pretending, pretending to work. And then, and then this website popped up. You know how in porn there's a lot of pop-ups. So this career cast popped up. So I said, hey, why not look for another job? I wasn't very happy. And uh, I started browsing, looking at jobs. And then it occurred to me, and these are jobs listed by importance. And it occurred to me that advertising is, is, is quite far down the line. I mean, I, was, I kept looking for it, and I couldn't find it. I mean, I found audiologist, but not librarian. And then, uh, where's advertising? I kept, <laughs> it's crazy. And then I found it. I found it, 118. Sorry, 118 between telephone, installer, repair, repair and <laughs> cashier. So that's, <laughs> that's how people um, view our, our, our industry. I mean, they don't know we have 9,000 award shows that we uh, go to. And I mean, you meet, you meet your aunt in, uh, over dinner and she's like, so what are you doing now? Are you, are you I'm like, I'm in advertising. She's like, yeah, but like, what are you going to do for real? <laughs> like, no, that is, that is what I do for real. When are you going to get a real job? So, I mean, waitress is one, one, two. So, so make sure you tip the waitress today. <laughs> and uh, I think Stefan Sagmeister said it best, the graphic designer, in persuading people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have in order to impress others that don't care. Advertising is possibly the phoniest existence, uh, uh, field in existence today. Thank you, Stefan. And I mean, there's something to learn from that. I mean, I'm not here to obviously diss our industry, but I mean, we need to step back and realize that it really isn't rocket science. And it, I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had, and it really is an amazing industry if we kind of become conscious of that, you know, and we don't have all these fights and bad energy in agencies and all that. You walk into a lot of agencies and there's a lot of bad energy coming from this, like, importance, you know, that's not really there and shouldn't be there. And suddenly, great ideas will begin to emerge because nothing is that serious. I mean, I realized I was, I was on the TV and radio jury, uh, um, and I saw a lot of great things and heard a lot of great stuff. And we had a great jury, by the way, um, led by Chuck Porter. It was, it was some great people in the room. But I, I noticed how much better uh, like South African radio is as opposed to te television. You know, So much talent in, in radio, yet not, not as much in television. And then it occurred to me, it's probably because there's a lot more money in television. So there's a lot, people are a lot more serious when it comes to television. Yet in radio, you know, if you, if, you, if you fuck up, you can just redo it. So that's why the radio is so much better. But I wish, I wish they can take this almost nonchalant kind of feeling to television, you know, but, but they're not. Uh, that's a th the, the second thing I, I learned. People have better things to do. I mean, it, everything ties up to the fact that it's not rocket science. I mean, every slide you see, you can tie it back to the fact that advertising is not rocket science. And this is the second thing. You, you, you do an ad, and you think people are just waiting for it. They're waiting to see it, when in fact, <laughs> they're not. They don't give a shit. I mean, it has to be really, 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 really good. And even then, they're not going to give a shit. You know? So people have a lot better things to do with their time. I mean, over 50% of the internet is porn, 50%. Oh, one, one more thing. I didn't know there would be somebody from Google here. I didn't know Steve would be here, so I made most of these things up. But I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite close. I made them up this morning. But they, I mean, they make sense. More than 25% of Google <laughs> queries <laughs> are sex related. 5% of these are mine. No, but this is, this is where it gets really interesting. And this is, this is a true stat that I got from a friend that works at Google. I swear, this, the last two are 100% true. Cat videos make up 30% of YouTube content. 
and 130 hours of YouTube videos are uploaded every hour. That's, that's what you're competing with. 130 hours every hour that's, of content, that's crazy. And when you combine the last two together, that's quite really crazy. That's like 45 hours of cat videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, humanity is, is kind of getting dumber as we speak. I don't know if you love cat videos, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone, but there's a lot of cat videos out there. And, and people care a lot more about cat videos than they do about your new campaign, you know, and how many... Um, so yeah, people are watching porn, obviously, and more importantly, something changed in the last 10 years when I started advertising is that you could force your ad down people's throat. You can interrupt their sitcom, you can interrupt their series, you can interrupt their film, you can just shove your ad up their ass. But today, people watch what they want, and that's universally different. This is, this is fundamentally going to change everything we do. They will no longer watch your ad unless they want to. They can skip it, and you, you want to you wanna make them actually look for it and search for it and share it. So that completely changes the quality of advertising. You can't do a two-minute corporate ad for a bank and expect it to be seen anymore. No one's going to sit through it. So that should, that's something to think about. So who are we up against? What are, what are they watching? They're watching Masha and the Bear. 119 million views. So that's, that's twice the population of the UK. I took that from Steve. <laughs> Tomorrowland. They're watching Tomorrowland, 2012. They watch something that's two years old, and three years old, and it's got 119 million views. They're watching The Ultimate Dog Tease. The Annoying Orange, 158 million. <laughs> Masha and the Bear again. This time, it's episode 36. <laughs> so Masha's, Masha's got it going for her. Charlie bit my finger, of course, with a staggering 805 million views. I mean, just to put this in perspective, this is The Gorilla by Fallon in London, one of my favorite ads ever, directed by Juan Cabral and written by the guy as well. This is The Gorilla. I'm sure we all know The Gorilla. This is... Grand Prix in Cannes, 2007. One of the, one of the, I mean, one of the most coveted ads ever. And it's got seven million views. Masha and the Bear has 119. <laughs> so, I, I mean, again, it's, it's, it really puts things in perspective. So, um, uh, when I was in Elephant, and we got a client uh, uh, that does halva. I don't know if you know halva is. Halva is a, 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 it's like a sesame and sugar kind of sweet. It's very cheap. And it's, it's also got a lot of energy, so a lot of people eat it in prison. And, <laughs> and he, he came up to us. No, but Egyptians love it. I mean, everybody has it for breakfast. It's, 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 it's a quintessential part of Egyptian uh, uh, breakfast. So he came up to us and he said, I want to use a celebrity. And we said, but why? He said, because people love celebrities and they're going to share the film and I want people to share the film. And so we said, but why would people share it because there's a celebrity. He said, because people trust celebrities. I want to get like a really expensive celebrity. I have the budget for it, and I want to get a celebrity. So we said, why don't you wait till we come up with the concept, and then let's see if the concept is married to getting a celebrity, you will get a celebrity. But let's, let's go to the drawing boards first. Let us think for a week or two, and then we'll come back, and if it involves a celebrity, we don't mind. But I don't want you to tell us to get a celebrity from the get-go, because getting a celebrity is not an idea. You know, a lot of people call you with a brief, and they say, hey, we've got Brad Pitt. Okay, but what's the idea? What's he going to do? <laughs> they think getting the celebrity is the idea. So, so he wanted to get a celebrity, and we said, uh, let, us, let us think about it. And when we went to the drawing boards and started thinking, we thought he wants celebrity because people trust celebrities. But when it comes to halva, people should trust prisoners because they eat it the most. <laughs> they, they eat it more than anyone. And, and we told him, you know, if, if we do something, he said, we can't use prisoners and put them on TV and put them on the internet. And we said, if you do that, people will share it. And it'll be so provocative and controversial and people will talk about it. And that's, and that's what happened. We, we did these ads. This was the concept, you know, people who know Halva love Bawadi. Bawadi is the brand. And we did these little... <laughs> تبقى تراب الحلاوه دي بتفضل ماسكه نفسيها وما فيهاش زيت ما ما بترملش نفض لنفسك يا نجم وارميها بقى يا باشا في السنسانه السنه ما بتحجرش وبتفضل ناعمه زي ما هي والسمسم اللي فيها عافيه قوي يا باشا اللي فاهمين في الحلاوه بيحبوا البوادي 
and then there's another one. منتج نباتي مية في المية ما فيهاش مبيض ولا كيماوي ولا فيها دهون حيوانية. السمسم طبيعي والسكر طبيعي وما فيهاش أي مواد حفص. والحاجة اللي مش طبيعية أنا أفهمها وأنا أعرف من طعمها. ضيفين عليها فانيليا. فانيليا. يعني من الآخر كده حلاوة عشر على عشرة. صح يا تهاني؟ صح يا أم وربنا. اللي فاهمين في الحلاوة بيحبوا البوادي. So anyway, um, obviously this hit the million view mark in less than a week. Uh, he was scared out of his ass, obviously the client, but I mean, then the papers picked it up. You had obviously the occasional um, mother who complained and sent complaints saying we don't want prisoners on television, this is offensive. And so, but it, but it, it did create the hype that you want advertising to create if, if you want people to care about it, you know? It has to be this bold and, and this daring. Um, stay inexperienced, and it's amazing how Steve's last uh, video was about this exactly. And, it, and it's also amazing how people come into advertising with so many ideas and so much freshness. And then throughout the years, slowly but surely, they kind of die inside, you know. <laughs> so I think, I think it's very important to stay inexperienced and stay away from all the paperwork and stay away from all the research that's being done and never go to a focus group. I've never been to a focus group in my life. Every time there's a focus group, I'd call in sick. <laughs> I just don't want to go and, 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 and see what they have to say about it. I mean, just try to, try to keep a safe distance from any brief you're working on. When there's a pitch and everybody in the agency is going crazy and hormonal and, and, and you have an account director who's freaking out, try to stay home and go to the beach and work there. You know? you'll, you'll come up with the best ideas. I think it's really important uh, uh, to, to, to tap into that. If, if they invented the telephone at 18, so think of all the, the, the potential that all these interns and, and fresh grads have when they walk into an agency. Before they're told, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that, and this will never run, and this is not kosher, and this will be censored, and this is, the, you know, slowly but surely they become an ECD that's like, what do we have today, you know? So, I mean, it, it, they come in with so much energy, and this is, this is how I, I know that because I started with a lot of energy, and then slowly but surely uh, they shoot your wings down. This, the, uh, uh, these print ads I did at uh, Promo 7 when I was in Dubai. So again, I was still at the beginning of my career and uh, I had never worked on Sony before. So I, I stepped into an agency, it was my first few weeks at the agency and everybody had worked on Sony for years and they know Sony inside out and they know the guide platform and, the, and, and they know the brand guidelines and they know the global, all that stuff. I didn't know any of that. So, so my partner and I came up with, with these print ads and everybody said they look nothing like a Sony ad and they tried to kill him inside the agency. And that's, I think that's the scariest thing, ideas that die in-house. You know, they don't even get a chance to let the client kill it. You know, they kill it inside, you know. And then after a while, you start to kill it inside of you. So it never, it never even leaves you. So, but, but I was very obnoxious and again, I always kept a distance and I said, no, I want to present it. I'm going to present it. I'm going to have to present it. And I did and they loved it. They, they just immediately fell in love with it. And I, obviously it wasn't presented like that. It was presented as just some Sharpie comps. But I mean, these went on to win uh, Silver Lion in Cannes in 2007. And uh, not only was it amazing for Sony and amazing for Dubai, it was also uh, one of the first lines in the region, you know. So this was the beginning of the Middle East winning Lions, so it was, it was, it was quite significant. Um, I think Fedi from uh, BBDO at the, at the time won a line as well. So it was, it was, it was two lines in print for, for the region, which was incredibly uh, inspiring to everybody else. And, and ever since, I think, the Middle East has been winning Lions year after year. So, th so these are done for Sony uh, from somebody who didn't know anything about Sony. And I'm sure that Towards the end of my stay at Promo 7, when I look at these ads, I, I now know how un-Sony they are, you know? But sometimes being un-Sony is not such a bad thing. Um, I, I did these at DDB in Berlin. Again, they're, people who work on Volkswagen know they're not very Volkswagen, but again, these want a can line, and obviously everybody in the agency is freaking out because they're, they don't feature a car. I said, of course they don't feature a car, they feature a hedgehog. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an analogy. <laughs> But where's the car? Can we just park? And then, and then this, this was the funniest. Obviously, trying, trying to do these things in Germany is 10 times harder, but luckily, I was in ECD by then, so I had a lot more power to say, no, this is how it's going to go. And, and, but it's really unfair when you have a junior art director who can't do these things. That's why the, the, the older people in an agency really need to encourage the younger people 
and not shoot their wings down so early. You know, they have a lot of potential. So this, this was for Loctite. This also won a can line. And uh, their problem was it was very cluttered. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> they said, it's way too cluttered. It's way too busy. So I said, okay. I mean, <laughs> obviously, that is, that is the idea. Okay. <laughs> Four. Um, again, I mean, in com compared to Steve's presentation, mine is very dumbed down. And there's, there's no technology in, in my presentation. So I have to apologize for that. But, but mine is, is, uh, is, is very stupid. And, and I think advertising in the future is going to sort of slowly move towards this kind of stupidity. Stupidity that, that's, that's, that's good. Not because, because I was in a jury and I voted an ad in and everybody said, but why do you like it? And I said, because it's very stupid. <laughs> and everybody looked at me. But, but actually, that's, that's a reason to like something. Because stupid is very honest. When something is, is just inherently kind of stupid and fun, and sometimes it's even badly done, there's a level of honesty in it that that's resonates with people. And um, I just want to show a video I love from the internet. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Ryan Gosling won't eat his cereal. I took my wife and slept with her. Ah. So it goes on forever, and, and, <laughs> and it's just very stupid, but 4 million views, and when you, when you type Ryan Gosling in Google, it says cereal before you're done. <laughs> so I mean, there's, there's no doubt that this resonated with people, and I think in the future, advertising needs to borrow from this kind of naivety that's so unresearched. I'm, so, I'm sure they've never researched this Ryan Gosling video. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure they never had a focus group that said, yeah, but what if mothers are offended by the cereal not looking so great? And, you know, can we get better cereal? You know, because it looks disgusting. So, I mean, I'm sure they didn't do any of that. They just went out and shot it. And that's what people are doing. While we are sitting in our focus group, all these people with their video cams and their iPhones are going out and shooting in 138 hours, or I don't remember, per, per hour of content. So uh, we need to go much faster, and for us to go faster, we need to stop being so anal about everything. Uh, we definitely need to stop researching, because I mean that's, I think every great idea out there uh, uh, would probably die or fail in research. I mean, if it, if it passes the research, it's probably a very bad thing. Um, and it's your job, like Steve Jobs said, I think it's your job to tell the consumer what they want. I mean, I think it's very strange for us to keep listening to the consumer and then giving the consumer what the consumer wants. And then, so what's our job then, you know? I think it's very important that we challenge the consumer and give the consumer things they didn't know they wanted. And just as a very basic example, and I've given this in many presentations before, the iPad, the very first iPad failed research. Failed research miserably. And that's in, it's in, it's in Steve Jobs' biography. So, I mean, this is something to think about. Uh, here's another campaign of mine that failed research miserably also, <laughs> but we uh, went ahead and did it anyway. كنت فين يا عاصم؟ عمك مستنيك من الصبح. بص لقيت ايه بره؟ ايه ده مش ده المسدس اللي بيكلبز الحياة؟ ما انت عارفاه اهو. بتاع في ده بيحول اي حاجة تكلبز. بصوا. بطل هبل وتعالى اقعد جنب عمتك. دي؟ عاصم انت اتجننت واتهبلت ولا ايه؟ اديله 
And I think this is a very good example because every focus group in the world, I don't care if you're in Durban, Malaysia, Cairo, New York, every focus group in the world will tell you not to kill that baby. <laughs> but that's exactly what everybody in the room laughed about. Focus groups do not know what works. They do not. Coach, <laughs> So, yeah, uh, the client wasn't very happy when he saw the final product. Because uh, when we said guns and lasers, he expected Star Wars. And uh, <laughs> he wasn't very happy with how stupid it looked, you know. And, and sometimes you're not on the same wavelength. And it's very hard to sell something to a client by saying it's going to look very stupid and it's going to be very cool. You know, they don't get that. So, I mean, it was tough. But, but then it won the Lynx Grand Prix and uh, um, he, he became a lot more comfortable. I won't, I won't <laughs> torture you with another one. Um, I mean, a lot of the client servicing and account handlers in the room won't like me for this one, but this is so important. I think presenting one idea is just so important and it gives you so much integrity. I really don't know why Agencies still present options. I think options are for hairdressers. <laughs> Why are we presenting options? Why do we say, I mean, it, it gives you such lack of integrity when you say, we have four options to present today. Why do we present number one? And then we say, but we also like number two. And maybe if you want, we can do number three. You, seriously, you look like a hairdresser. As opposed to walking in there and saying, this is what we want to do for you. And if we don't meet there, then we shouldn't be working together. This is how advertising should become. This is where it should evolve to. You should meet where you, 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 on the same brainwave. You should come in and say, with all your power and with all, and, and it gives you so much credibility when it's just one option. When you present it and you're so passionate about it and then they say, do you have anything else? And you say, no, we don't have anything else. Because this is exactly what you should do. Otherwise, then everything, every option you present lacks the integrity and then it becomes weak. And, and I think terms like, what's the agency recommendation, are completely pathetic. And, and these things have been handed down to us from generations and generations of advertising that started with Procter & Gamble 50 years ago. And we're still using them. It, it really amazes me how we still use the Procter & Gamble system to do ideas that have nothing to do with Procter & Gamble anymore. The, I mean, this system existed to present two mothers in the kitchen with detergent. This is, this is where the system came. So sometimes you have an option where the, the detergent is over the washing machine, and then there's an option where it's in the cupboard somewhere. You know? That's why options sort of developed. <laughs> but today, there's no room for options. And, and I mean, it, it's, it's tough. It's, I know it's easier said than done. But this is what we should all be um, sort of gravitating towards. Uh, I'm going to show uh, some panda cheese ads. I don't know who, if anyone's familiar with them. But these, are, these are from Egypt. And um, for years, panda was a very unknown uh, cheese. It was like number nine or ten in a very cluttered cheese market in Egypt. So it was a very unknown cheese, unheard of. And their advertising looked like this. And I'm sorry to show you this, but this is, I think, important. <laughs> This is the cheese shot. So, yeah, it's, it, was, it was very painful. And this, this ad is from 2009. It's not from 1975. It's, 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 it's quite contemporary. And, and so the Panda guys came to us and said we want to do a campaign. And we asked them, the first thing to ask them is, why is it called Panda? And 
they didn't know. So I said, so does it come from panda milk? Do you, do you milk the panda? I mean, what, why is the cheese called panda? It's very confusing. They said, we don't know. It's just the, the, the CEO likes panda, so he called it panda. And we said, yeah, but you can't, mess, you can't mess with consumers' minds like that. You can't call it panda and then never mention the panda anywhere, you know. There's either a panda or we'll just change the name. <laughs> and it's kind of weird. You feel like you're eating a panda cheese and it's... So we went back and we presented one idea that obviously involved the panda. Because we said we can't, you know, it's, there's the panda in the room, you know. So it's, it's the, it's the <laughs> we, have to, we have to discuss it. And, and they... they listened to it and they saw our storyboards and obviously they weren't happy. They were very uncomfortable and they said, okay, can we see something else? And that's another thing. When you present more than one idea, you're almost sure to know that the client will pick the worst one. <laughs> Everybody in the room knows that. They're going to pick the most comfortable, safest, the one they've seen before. That's the one they're going to pick. And that's what the panda guys wanted to do. They wanted, to, they wanted another safe one. And we said, sorry, that's all we have. And, they, and, and everybody in the room was very uncomfortable. And uh, everybody was extremely uncomfortable. And the, the, the lucky thing is they had a deadline and they had media booked. And these things come to help you, you know. <laughs> so some guy in the room said, why don't we just do it? You know, what the hell? Just don't make it too aggressive. And we did these. Faith, I'm going to buy some looks you get Just you know why. And then. No, 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 So yeah, <laughs> and that and that changed everything. That that I mean that meeting I think changed everything. That guy that said we have a media booked and we need to we need to shoot it changed everything. It changed my career. I mean the fact that I went into that room with one idea really put me somewhere else. I mean until then I was a very local creative doing ads for a local market. And then this happened. Overseas ads for panda cheese have gone viral on the internet. Egyptian company Arab Dairy, which makes the cheese, is airing a series of commercials that show a panda terrorizing people. All of this is done to reinforce the product's tagline, never say no to panda. So this is, this is ABC News halfway across the globe. This is 9 p.m. news in New York City. So uh, it's crazy. I mean, to go for... A, and this is, this, this, is um, a couple, this is a year old. I think it's about 40 million now, the views. Um, in, in 2011, the year, the year that we aired it, it was um, one of the most watched um, viral videos in the world. This is the Guardian front page um, digital blog. So it was more than uh, all black still training. <laughs> this is Campaign Magazine. Uh, this is during the revolution. <laughs> during the revolution in Egypt, we saw uh, graffiti of pandas popping up some in places. Um, a friend of mine got me this T-shirt from China. Never say no to panda. Uh, and then this, to top it off, sorry, to top it off, this is a Russian music video. So, I mean, obviously, sometimes the panda gets too much, and you walk into a room, and you're like, oh, you're the panda guy, you know? So you try to move beyond that after a while. But I mean, it does get me free shots and a lot of bars, and it's a, it's a good conversation starter.
So, I mean, walking into that room with one idea kind of saved my life. And I'm, I'm, I can guarantee you, I mean, if we had just one more idea, they would have bought the other one. So it's, sometimes it's, it's clever to corner them, and especially when you're uh, tight on time. Make your clients uncomfortable. Again, that's, it all kind of falls into what I said before. I mean, you need to make them uncomfortable because if they're comfortable, then you're not doing, you're not doing your job. I mean, clients are only comfortable. Clients don't have an imagination. You need to remember that. You have an imagination. Clients are only comfortable if they've seen it before or, or, or if they've seen the formula or the format before. They know how it works. You know, they've seen this in an Audi ad a couple of years ago. Yeah, 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 that works. We like that, you know. But if it's something entirely new and if it's fresh, they have to be uncomfortable. You have to make your clients have this face. <laughs> this, is, this is the face you should have in every meeting. This is, this is what you should be. If you don't have this face, then you're not in the vicinity of a good idea. <laughs> And then this is, this is our Bawedi client again. Miraculously, he came back to us two years later uh, to do another campaign for him. This time he had a spread. So again, it's halva, but this time it's spreadable. So it's almost like peanut butter. And uh, yeah, this is what we did for him. Obviously, when we presented it, he was very uncomfortable because it involved this. <laughs> قدامك 30 ثانية شوف بقى نفسك في ايه نفسي اخش دريم بارك اركب الصاروخ صاروخ ايه ده في 6 اكتوبر والدنيا زحمة والمحور واقف طب نفسي في جاكيت جلد هو انا جايب لك جاكيت جلد منين؟ النهاردة لحد ومحلات قافلة واحنا في الصيف اساسا طب انا عندي فكرة كوباية ماء بسرعة يا صلاح البوادي سبريد حلاوة في السريع so it's, uh, you, you can see why it was very uncomfortable. I mean, and, and I think doing a, an ad with a suicide bomber in, in, in Cape Town or Joburg is very different than doing it in the Middle East. <laughs> in the Middle East, it's, it's, it's not a joke, it's, it's serious. So I mean, he was very uncomfortable throughout the process, but then he loved the ad in the end. And that's, that's what happens. I mean, it comes back to reward you. I mean, once, once you kind of go with it and tell them to trust you and, and they stay uncomfortable throughout the process, but then it, turn, it turns around and then they become very happy clients. I mean, I'm not telling you to obviously have an uncomfortable client for life. I mean, then they obviously leave you. But it's, it's, they're just uncomfortable during the process and then they turn around. Uh, this is another very important one. The client is not the king. Again, I say the client is not the king because you're always told that the client is, is the king. We're not, we're not a restaurant. You know, the client is not the king. Unless, of course, the client is the king, which, <laughs> which happened to me earlier this year. I was shooting an ad for uh, Moroccan tourism, and uh, I, I was in Greece on holiday, and I wanted to extend, so I called the production house, and I said, can I stay for two more days? And she told me in a very like, serious French accent, mais Ali, c'est pas vrai, le, le, le client il, is the king. <laughs> the client is the king. So I said, okay, yeah, he, is, he really is the king, so I had, to, I had to go back. So unless the client is the king, the client is not the king. Uh, and and uh, this, this happened with Google. When Google first came to, to Egypt, and this was the first time they, they were going to advertise, all the big agencies pitched for them. But at Elephant, we weren't doing any pitching. We, we, pitching was against our, our policy. So. But all the agencies pitched for them, and in all the meetings, they literally kissed their ass because everybody wanted to work for Google. So they, it, Google got the impression from all these meetings that these clients, these agencies were going to do everything they asked for. They really treated them like the king. So Google picked up the phone and they called us. They said, we heard you guys don't give a shit about clients and <laughs> you, do, you do what you want in the end and this is, this is what we want. We want to do great films. We don't want to be pampered and treated like clients. We, don't, we want you to do the thinking for us. And uh, we had a big meeting with them and it was amazing the, the experience they went through when, when they sat with all the big agencies uh, how pampered they were and how, you know, they told them, you know, whatever you want, we're going to do and, you know, you guys call the shots. And so they, they, they actually left. And these are, these are, I mean, Google is obviously a very young client, but I mean, more, more of these clients are going to be popping up. So sometimes it even harms you to treat the client like the king. And uh, we, we did this to launch Chrome in Egypt.
So it's, it's, it's very nice when, when you have a client that can trust you that much because then you just go out and have fun and they pay for it. I mean, that's it's just the ideal uh, scenario. I'm going to skip this example because I'm, I'm running short on time. Yeah, well. Unfortunately. Okay, this is uh, another one I cannot stress enough, which is respect the product a lot more than you respect the process. Because you meet a lot of people who respect the process. They're all about the contact report and PPM document being all set up and crazy and nice. And you know, they're all about the call being great, you know. But sometimes the best ads come out of a very messy process. So I'm, I'm a fan of the product. I always, my loyalty is to the film or to the print ad or to the digital campaign that we're doing, to the final product, the thing people are gonna see. No one's ever seen one of my ads and asked me, yeah, but how was the PPM, was it nice? <laughs> no one gives a shit. All you're left with is a quick time on your laptop and that's, that's what matters. And, and five years down the line, it even matters more. You know, no one remembers any of the other stuff. But you find a lot of people who care more about the process than the product. You know, you find a lot of people in production who work for the PPM. They don't work for the film. You know, they want everything to be ready for the PPM. But what about the shoot? You know, did you get it for the shoot? They're like, no, no, let's just get the pictures in the document now. You know? What about the actual thing that we're doing? What about our job? You know? We're here for the product. And always, always keep your eye on the prize. And uh, that happened um, a couple years ago with Leah Burnett um, in Dubai. They sent us a brief. We were working on it. Uh, I was shooting it in Beirut. And then halfway through production, I decided to change the brief and change the, the whole script. And every, production freaked out, the agency freaked out, everybody freaked out, and I said, yeah, but that's such a, such a, it's a much better idea for the same brief. And they said, yeah, but we're aligned and we're ready and the PPM is tomorrow. I said, yeah, I know, but I don't want to shoot it anymore. I want to, I want to change it. And it made everybody tremendously uncomfortable. But I mean, I, I kept going at it. And, and I, don't, I told them, I don't care if we're aligned if we're all aligned, it doesn't matter. If we're aligned on something bad or if we're aligned on shit, then it doesn't matter. It's better to realign <laughs> than to stay aligned. Sometimes we just go through the, we just go through the works because everybody's aligned and nobody wants to rock the boat. I think it's very important to, that if you ever realize what you're doing is shit, to stop and rock the boat. It's okay to rock the boat because again, it's not rocket science and, and, and instead we shot these. I don't know what I know, but I know what I don't know. I don't know if he was being passive aggressive or just plain fragile. But when a man's fragile, he casts no shadow. C'est vrai, mais il manque quelque chose. Okay. So answer me this: Was it his alter ego that was ravishing his mind, or his father's? Which father? Last one. So cold. I'm real cold. Can you do one last thing for me? Sure, man. When you get back, I need you to find my little Jenny. Give her this. We've been through two black holes, Alex. By the time I get back, she'll be 128 years old. No, if you go the other way. Cancel the sun's gravity, reducing time on Earth by the diminutive effect. I'll make you get out just before she was born. Okay. You're probably 
You have to wait three years before you give her that. That means... That means you'll still be there when I get back. You're not dying, Alex. You're only dying over here, but not there. If I harness the right amount of energy, I could drill a black hole through the sun, reducing its heat by 70%, and meet you in the future past, my friend. Meet you in the future past. That's where we're going to meet. In the future past. You're not dying yet. So yeah, the, the <laughs> these went on to win a, a, a gold line, my, my first gold line, and um, they won a line again this year, and they, they won a DNAD for Best Director, uh, Yellow Pencil, which in my opinion is the most coveted award. Everybody in this room should quit after the Yellow Pencil. I think the Yellow Pencil is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's why I joined the industry, and it's, it's it's just incredibly beautifully designed and how it sits in a bookshelf and it's very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for that. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and it's an amazing award show as well, I mean, all together. Uh, I have to go very fast, so the faster the better, literally. Um, uh, yeah, uh, good ideas are like sitting ducks, so I mean, when you have a nice idea, just go out and get it done because if you leave it lying around, somebody in the agency is going to kill it. Or some client is going to show it to his aunt in a dinner party and she's going to say, yeah, but it's not so nice and then it dies. I mean, the, the longer you give an idea from conception to production, the more likely it's going to die. So you need to go really fast when you think you have a good idea. That's, uh, that's very important. I mean, we, uh, at Elephant, we had this idea for Lika gum, which is a chewing gum, and the client didn't like it. Uh, nobody liked it. They didn't want to pay for it, so we went out and we shot it. And it didn't cost much to shoot it, so we shot it in my sister's backyard and uh, we, showed, we showed it to them as a finished product and then they loved it. You know, and this is always the case. You need to go out and get it done. You know, that's, that's, that's very important. Um, uh, another really nice campaign that's very close to my heart that I did for FA, for uh, uh, BBDO in, in, in Dubai with uh, Fedi as a creative director. He's, he's actually here, he's a member of the jury. And he came up with this idea while we were shooting Snickers here in Cape Town. And we were supposed to go back to Dubai, do all the approvals, all that. I said, why don't we sit and shoot it first and then go back to Dubai, you know, and with, a, with a finished product. And, and that, that did very well for us because obviously it won a, a gold at the, at the Lynx. And uh, this is... Monica, can you take this down to HR? Hey. Hey. Can you take the Dante jar? And then there's this one. Hey, Amy. Are you here for the yoga class? <laughs> hey. <laughs> mm. Hey, Amy. Are you here for the yoga class? Yeah. Good morning, Miss Jane. <laughs> That's our favorite one. Good morning, class. Good morning, Miss Jane. Please sit. So, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I'm pretty sure if we waited to go back to Dubai and get approvals and all that, we wouldn't have shot it. And sometimes when you have the finished product, it's so much easier to sell it. Because, like I said, the clients don't have an imagination. I don't want to be offensive to anybody. I mean, obviously, some clients have an imagination. But <laughs> most clients that I've met, unfortunately, don't. And then the last thing I want to say is, um, if the ad still sucks, just pretend you didn't do it. I mean, it's, it's really easy. I mean, that's, it just takes a lot of pressure off your chest when you know you can do that. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of ads I'm not happy with, and when people ask me, I just say, I don't know. It's from our agency, but I, re I really don't know who did it. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know how, how they shot that shit. Uh, I know I said 10. Uh, there are actually 11 points. This just 10 looks much better on the poster. I mean, no one, no one wants to come here 11 things I heard. In. So um, 11 is good as the enemy of great. 
because um, good pleases clients, good wins your pitches, good gets you hired, good gets you laid, but great is what matters. Thank you. <laughs>